Okay. Okay, we're back. We're live. It's uh, the uh, 4 o'clock rock here on a given Thursday. And I'm here with uh, Shackley Ruffetto. He's the chief judge retired of the Second Circuit Court in Maui. And uh, he's on our board and comes to see us mostly for board meetings or after a trip. In this yeah. case, it's both. Because he got back only a couple of weeks ago from China where he had a very interesting time. We want to talk about that today. It was in Kunming, China. Uh, why did you go, Shackley? I went to, um, well, every year I go and serve as a volunteer judge for the China rounds of the Jessup International Law Moot Court Competition, which is a worldwide competition. About 90 countries participate. Each country uh, has their own competition. Uh, we do it in the United States as well. It's a huge competition. And, um, and You've been doing this a long time in many places. Now. About 11 years, yeah. Wow. And, um, what is a moot court? Well, it's, it's like moot court in law school, right? <laughs> it's, a, it's an appellate argument, uh, like an, an argument before the Supreme Court of Hawaii or the Intermediate Court of Appeals. And in the case of the Jessup, they have um, a committee or a law professor who put together a really complex problem and that's given to the students, and they have to learn to argue both sides. Mm. And in China, we had, I think China's the largest program now. There were 51 law schools participating, and the top five were selected to go then to Washington, D.C. and participate right, right about now. Whoa. And um, I've also um, <coughs> uh, served in the uh, finals in Washington, D.C. and also in uh, Russia several times. Oh, you're times. a big part of this then. That's so, uh, clearly, I mean, what kind of a... What kind of a problem would you pose to Chinese students in Kunming? Well, um, let me just say, the competition is all in English. And in uh, China, uh, the government very wisely, in my opinion, requires that uh, college students learn English, which has the result of making uh, educational opportunities in the English-speaking world mm -hmm. available mm -hmm. to Chinese students, and many of them, as you may know, come here for LLM degrees and more and more JD degrees. Uh, and, um, and, so, and because it's in English, um, we can, you know, people like me can go and, and participate, which I couldn't if it, <coughs> certainly couldn't if it was in Chinese. Yeah, sure. So can you give us uh, some of the facts and the problems so we can sure. appreciate its complexity? Yeah, um, this year was, uh, was uh, usually there's four major issues, and uh, to just give you a general idea, they, it's a very complicated fact situation, but in this case, it involved two nations, one of which was more developed than the other, and there was an, an animal called the caliph yak, a kind of a yak that migrated back and forth across the, <coughs> the boundaries of these countries. In the northern country, was a very primitive country that worshipped this yak and used all of, all of the yak for food, for religious purposes, for shelter, etc., etc. And um, a company in, in the uh, southern uh, country, uh, they give these countries odd names, and I can't, it's hard for me to remember the, the <laughs> names. Anyway, the, the southern country um, had spun off one of their government agencies that was involved in research in pharmaceuticals into a private corporation. Somebody from that company went north and noticed that people who um, uh, eat um, soup made out of the gallbladder of the caliph yak have great health and decided to synthesize, see if he could synthesize <coughs> whatever it was out of this soup that made people healthy. And he found uh, that there was a particular enzyme oh. uh, that, yeah, and I forget, I have the Lustig enzyme, it's called, and he created a medicine <coughs> called uh, Galvectra that turns out to be incredibly successful oh. at, at treating oh. um, diabetes. Is, all, is this true? No, no, this is... These are all made-up names. Well, I, you know, there may be germs of truth here and there, but, uh, yeah, the names are all made up. Uh, there are yaks in, uh, in Mongolia, <laughs> though. I've, I've, seen them. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen the yaks in Mongolia. And there were some, some of the uh, judges kind of quibbled with the, with the facts, you know. But, but it's, just, it's just a... It's intended to raise um, complicated issues of international law. One of them, for instance, is... Um, should the, should the southern state be responsible for harming uh, the people who rely upon the yak in the northern state, even though um, they've spun this function of the pharmaceutical function off into a private company? Are they responsible for the uh, 
for the harm caused by a private company, and that's a whole issue of international law. Wow, how go, interesting. You you know, the, and there's this like four or five issues like that, but they get really quite complicated. This reminds me of um, something I read recently about the One Belt, One Road initiative in China, namely that the Chinese have established a law school somewhere in the southwest of China um, to teach um, law students international law in mm -hmm. all of the countries that <coughs> One Belt, One Road is supposed to pass through mm -hmm. <coughs> on the notion that uh, the Chinese want to be familiar with international law, with the laws of all those countries, so that they can plan, you know, good moves, mm -hmm. and so that they can, you know, defend their position, if necessary, as they build the infrastructure in One Belt, One Road. And this international mm, view of things mm -hmm. that you saw in Jessup, is, it, it does suggest the same kind of uh, international awareness. Absolutely. Um, mm -hmm. And, uh, for instance, um, after the competition is complete, myself and a couple of other lawyers uh, do an extra day of training for the, the top teams on advocacy. And one of the things I talk to them about is basic common law evidence and how to use the concept of relevancy to decide what issues are, what facts are, are important to support or not support particular issues. And um, you know, the difference between direct and, and circumstantial evidence. For instance, there, there are international law cases that actually say that uh, if, if the case is to be proven by circumstantial evidence, then the standard of proof is beyond a reasonable doubt. And a student was arguing with me about that because I said, well, circumstantial evidence is entitled to this, can prove a fact just as, just as direct evidence. And I said, well, that was probably a civil law judge who wrote that opinion. And he, just, he just felt that that wasn't a reasonable inference. You know? So I didn't want to trust the circumstantial evidence. But that, that kind of uh, It's good. There's pushback. You want yeah. that, no? Yeah, yeah no, it was great. Yeah. Yes. It was great. So what's the role of somebody like yourself in a Jessup competition? Well, we serve as the volunteer judges. Um, they actually uh, 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 put... Uh, a uh, judge's brief together for us, but I usually take that and, and outline it myself and use it as a checklist in the because it's very complicated stuff. And, mm -hmm. and, and a lot of uh, international law is kind of what they call soft law. Mm -hmm. It's, uh, you know, some committee's draft report about such and such, and it may eventually become law or be adopted by the UN, but it's, it's tough to argue from things like that. Plus, they have a lot of difficulty understanding how to argue from a case. You know, what, what is, like, for instance, what is the holding of a case? They don't teach that concept, apparently, in Chinese law schools. And uh, so... Uh, do American... I, I take it that Jesp is also done, the competitions were also held in this country? Yes. Uh, do American kids have an easier time of it? I don't think so. It's pretty complicated. Yeah. Uh, well, it's not only complicated, but it's a, it's a world view. It's the sort of thing, looking over your own boundary mm -hmm. and trying to appreciate multinational litigation, multinational issues. Well, they might have an easier time because they learn the common law, you know, our common mm -hmm. law system, we, you know, the case method and, and stare decisis and all those concepts that we're very familiar with. They don't learn those, those concepts. And At the end of the day, you find that Chinese kids, students, law students, who engage in the Jessup say in China, say in Kunming, are pitted against American uh, competitors from the U.S.? Well, they are when they come to the, to mm -hmm. the uh, well, they're matched up against teams from all over the world. Uh, it's, they have quite a few um, social activities at the, at the uh, finals in Washington, D.C. as well. So these people, these, these kids have a chance to uh, network, and, and it's, it's really quite yeah. an interesting program. It started, it started, Jessup, you know, was a Harvard professor who was one of the drafters of the U.N. Charter. That's great. That's yeah. great. So it's That's a great, great program. And then yeah. in China, what's nice is that the professor who runs the program uh, holds it uh, usually one year in Beijing at Renmin University and then the next year someplace else. And that's why we we're in Kunming this year. And next year we're going to be in Hainan Island. And uh, as a result of participating, I've been to a number, of, I've probably been in 15 or so of the major <coughs> cities in China. Are you unique uh, or there are other Americans there? No, there are others. And then there are people from all over, there Russians, people from Finland, uh, Australians, people from Hong Kong. All speaking uh, English. 
Yes. All dealing with the same fact pattern. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Wow. Well, it sounds like a great time because you get to meet people and you get to you get to engage with them and um, um, and and bring these kids up as international kids. Yes, and they're 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 very hardworking students, very very earnest about what they're doing. Great, the, great. <laughs> well, you can, but one of the things they do is you can't actually uh, interact with them until the competition is over and they have the final closing ceremony, which I have a photograph of. And then they have a big dinner. And of course, then you can sit with the students and they all want, they ask you, oh, how did I do? Do you have any you know, suggestions? And trying to remember who they are. And yeah, of course. <laughs> if you've sat on about six of these yeah, things. Some <laughs> great fun, make relationships that last forever, yeah. Yeah, it's very interesting. Plus, in, in this case, um, uh, since I knew we were going to be in Kunming, I, I knew that that was the home of the Flying Tigers and that there was a museum there. And so I, made a special request to go a little early so that I could uh, go see the museum and, uh, and look around a little bit, which was... Which, what, what, which what, what are the Flying Tigers? Flying Tigers was an American volunteer group of pilots and mechanics and support people um, who President Roosevelt, uh, before we were in uh, the United States entered into World War II, uh, allowed to um, be created Try and travel to China and fight as a part of the national. What's na the nationalist Chinese now? The folks in uh, uh, Taiwan, um, but at that time it was Chiang Kai-shek, who was the head of the nationalist Chinese army, and actually flew and fought the Japanese. Um, uh, the actual fighting started slightly after Pearl Harbor, mm. but they were over there before and getting ready. And they, were, they were, flew for the Chinese Air Force for about seven months and very successful. Proved that the Japanese military machine could be stopped, which up until that time, like the German army, had been sort of rolling over everything in, in Asia. Yeah. And, um, it slowed them down. Yeah, and the one thing I, I was very <clears throat> pleased to see is that the building that, uh, that the museum is in uh, is uh, an older building that they've preserved, and, it's, and it has a sign outside that it's part of it, the Chinese heritage. It's a Chinese heritage building, or words to that effect. But it's being preserved, and, and the museum itself is very dignified and very nicely done, I think. I was I, really pleased to see that. I know you have photographs. Let's take a short break, Shackley. Okay. We'll come back and we'll go through your, your photographs to, to, to flesh this out. Okay. We'll be right back with Sounds Shackley good. Rafael. Aloha. I'm Wendy Lowe, and I'm coming to you every other Tuesday at 2 o'clock, live from Think Tech Hawaii. And on our show, we talk about taking your health back. And what does that mean? It means mind, body, and soul. Anything you can do that makes your body healthier and happier is what we're going to be talking about. Whether it's spiritual health, mental health, fascia health, beautiful smile health, whatever it means, let's take healthy back. Aloha. Aloha, this is Winston Welch. I am your host of Out and About, where every other week, Mondays at 3, we explore a variety of topics in our city, state, nation, and world, and uh, events, organizations, the people that fuel them. It's a really interesting show. We welcome you to tune in, and we welcome your suggestions for shows. Um, you got a lot of them out there, and we have an awesome a studio here where we can get your ideas out as well. So I look forward to you tuning in every other week where we've got some great guests and great topics. You're going to learn a lot. You're going to come away inspired like I do. So I'll see you every other week here at 3 o'clock on Monday afternoon. Aloha. Okay, we're back with Shackley Ruffetto, uh, the chief judge retired of the Second Circuit Court, who is an, an inveterate traveler. <laughs> and who is also an inveterate uh, Jessup competition person who has, yeah. for 11 years, he's been uh, involved in the Jessup competition, which is a worldwide moot court competition. This time he went to Kunming, China, learned a lot about the competition and about the Flying Tigers, too. Mm -hmm. So we're going to look at your pictures, Shackley. Let's okay. see them. All right. Uh, if you could put the first... This is a map just to orient you. Here's China. Uh, you have to kind of look in the... Southwest, uh, next to where Myanmar is today. In those days, it was Burma. That's where Kunming is. I don't know if you can see that. Uh, and that's where I was. So you see, Beijing is way up on the, in, the, um, 
on the east coast mm -hmm. of, of China. Mm -hmm. So I flew actually to Korea and then way over to Kunming, which is like another six hour flight. Wow. China is a huge country. Uh, interesting thing about Kunming is it's, it's actually, it's 6,000 feet above sea level. So it must be kind of like Denver is about that high. Yeah. And is it near a part of the Himalayas? It's not too far away. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I wouldn't say it's close, but I'll, I'll describe that a little bit in a, in a minute. But you see it's close to India, mm -hmm. where the Himalayas are. And uh, um, anyway, it's uh, the clear blue skies, beautiful weather. I mean, it's, um, it's the nicest city I've been in China, and I've been in about 15 of them. Wow. So say something no, none of the pollution that you see in Beijing or mm -hmm. Shanghai or mm -hmm. those other cities. OK, next. This is the, uh, all the students and all the, uh, all the international volunteer uh, judges. And this is the Yunnan University Law School building. This is about an hour out of uh, Kunming, China. It's a huge campus, which is about six years old. Uh, and it holds a number of different colleges, technical schools. Uh, in fact, I bumped into a, a guy at uh, breakfast uh, one day who was... Uh, a professor at uh, the um, Stanford Medical School, who was <coughs> who was there with his lawyer, apparently working on some sort of deal really? at the technical school. They wouldn't tell us what it was. Next, wait, they, oh. they're, they've got uh, they've got little little white oh. white tie. What is that? Those are th apparently that's the robe that uh, international justices wear. Mm. Looks like the Hague. I told them that we don't use anything fancy like that. <laughs> <laughs> it's more like a high school, uh, high school graduation gown. Okay, next. These are more pictures. This, this is um, uh, the three-judge panel that we use uh, to, to judge the competition. And the, these would be all the young people who, um, who were on the teams. And uh, whenever I preside, uh, I always like to have everybody come up and take a photograph after, it's, after we're done and everybody gets to have, have a photograph to take with them. So it's kind of a nice... Uh, a nice thing to do, I think. Next. These are all the people who did the extra training uh, uh, that I mentioned. Um, uh, let's see. Um, between myself and the lady there is uh, uh, Professor Wenqi Zhu. He's the head of the whole program in China. He's a senior professor at Renmin <coughs> University. The lady on his uh, right uh, it's Carol Kalinowski, who was one of the founders of the China Jessup program. And the lady next to her, on her right, is, uh, she's very interesting. She's a Chinese lady who was born in Vietnam, was a boat person with her family at the end of the Vietnam War. Mm -hmm. Somehow she got to New York, went to law school, and now she teaches at a big uni university law school in China. What a story. <laughs> and the men on her... On her <coughs> right is uh, uh, Peter Ong. He's a lawyer from Singapore. Uh, the lady with the purple scarf is, uh, is, a, is a law professor. She's from Inner Mongolia, actually, and she's a, a law professor at a big university in Beijing. And the other gentleman with the cap is uh, a lawyer from uh, Malaysia who does a lot of, uh, goes to a lot of moots uh, throughout Asia. Well, that's, a, that's a mixed group. Also. Yeah, it's a great group of people, actually. Next. Uh, this is the, the big sign they had up. Um, let's see. Uh, on my left uh, is um, Gennady Esikov. He's a, he's a professor from Moscow. And on my right uh, is Mati Jader. He's, uh, he's a lawyer from Finland. And I don't, I don't remember the names of the two ladies. But just to give you another idea. Of, we're on the way to the closing ceremony there. Next. This is the closing ceremony. They give you a little certificate to, uh, you know, mm -hmm. prove that you were there, I guess. <laughs> uh, I have a collection of those now. The man on the far right is, uh, uh, our, uh, on the left of the photograph, is a lawyer from Singapore. He's one of the sponsors, uh, provides financial support. And the man in the middle between he and I is a professor from um, Nepal. Kathmandu, and I, I don't remember the names of the other folks. Uh, although the lawyer on the far uh, right is one of the from one of the big law firms in China that sponsors the program, and that's the courtroom that we use. That's their moot courtroom <coughs> oh, at the university. Looks pretty nice with those big chairs and yeah. everything. Next, 
Oh, uh, um, <coughs> Kunming is the largest flower market in Asia. And I had occasion to go to it. This is just a couple of examples of the kind of bouquets that you could buy there. Huge, huge place with millions of flowers. Next. This is downtown Kunming, and I happened to just stumble across. This is a Catholic church, and I was pretty surprised to see that. Um, the um, Russian law professor, uh, Gennady, actually uh, inspected the place a little bit and, and it said on the uh, sign on the door that it was not actively uh, providing services but that if you wanted to attend a service you could go to some other location but I thought it was really interesting to see a big church like that with a big Christian cross right in the middle of a Chinese city these days yeah next this is the outside of the um, Flying Tigers Museum and you can see it's an older building, and it says Flying Tiger Museum in Chinese on the, on the, on the sign there. Uh, next. I don't have too many pictures of the inside. These are, these are some friends. Uh, this is inside the museum to give you an idea of what it looks like. Uh, the man on the left is, a, is a, a Chinese lawyer in Kunming, who I hosted here in Hawaii, actually, with another group of, uh, with the other, a group of other Chinese lawyers to observe a jury trial. And, visit our Supreme Court and so on mm. and and I knew he lived there so I so I let him know and he came with his uh, two folks from his um, from his staff and one I think the young man is uh, his nephew and the young lady is on his staff she's in the process of coming to the US to study actually she speaks very very good English she's from Inner Mongolia he's Mongolian Manchu uh -huh. combination uh -huh. Manchus were the last emperors of China ah. Oh, Next, something. these are the Flying Tigers, the famous uh, P-40, Curtis P-40, uh, uh, Kitty Hawk, I guess they called him, and mm -hmm. they painted the, the shark mouth on them, and uh, those became famous, uh, and they flew for, uh, as they say, flew for China for seven months. During the seven month period that they flew for China, they shot down 296 Japanese airplanes and lost 14 of their own pilots. So. He shows you how successful they were. Yeah. Next, this is the Burma Road. This, this is the road that runs from Burma to China in the old days. It's, it's now been replaced by a highway, they tell me, and it's called the Stillwell Highway, uh, named in honor of General Stillwell, who was a, a, a head of uh, US military forces in China during World War II. And he was uh, Claire, uh no, Claire, Chenault, Chenault. Claire Chenault was the head of the Flying Tigers. Right, right. And, and Stillwell would have been Claire Chenault, Chenault's boss. Right, uh, once the Americans came in. Ah, what happened right. was is that the, the Flying Tigers flew for the Chinese Air Force. And, and when, uh, after the U.S. came into the war, then we started sending U.S. forces to that part of China. And, uh, and the Flying Tigers, um, those who wanted to stay, some of them didn't were absorbed into the, into the Army Air Corps in those days. Mm -hmm. And Chenault became a Brigadier General. He'd, been, he'd actually was a colonel who had retired and, uh, and uh, had been working in China, started up the Flying Tigers, and then, and then came back into the Army Air Force. Great story. But, it, but the, it, it, um, go to the next one, please. This is another picture of the, of the Burma Road. There, there is a, a, an area of the, of the Burma Road called the Salween Gorge, which is, a, a, I guess, a mile deep gorge. And uh, um, part of the Japanese um, advance in uh, Indochina, which included Vietnam and Thailand and Burma, uh, was to come up the, the Burma Road and attack China from that direction. They'd already occupied most of eastern China, and they were bringing their forces up. And, uh, and they, they reached a place called the, the Salween Gorge, and the Flying Tigers bombed out the road and bombed their forces and stopped the advancement of the Japanese military, and it never entered China as a result of that. So the, they, they proved that, that um, we could defeat the Japanese Air Force, and we, we stopped the, the Japanese uh, advancement in China. The, and those were two great accomplishments of the Flying Tigers, and they were only in business for seven months. Mm -hmm. Can you believe that? And the gorge is in China rather than in French Indochina. It, I think it's just inside Burma. 
Burma. Tell you the truth. I'm, okay. not, I'm yeah. not exactly sure. I can see an arrow there pointing to Kunming. It says bridges, winding roads, vulnerable targets for bombs. Yeah, wow. yeah it might be. Oh. Might have been just inside China then. You're interesting. right. Interesting. Interesting. It's a Salwin Gorge, as it's, it's called. Yeah. Uh, next. Uh, this is a, a, a called a bloodshed, and uh, what what they what they. Claire Chenault, who was the head of the Flying Tigers, did is, I guess he had these made. I'm not sure whose idea it was. And in Chinese, it says, this, this person, they, they would sew these on their leather flying jackets. And it says, words to the effect that this is a foreigner who's flying and helping China uh, against the Japanese. Please help him. And this is signed by Pappy Boyington, who was a very famous marine aviator who served for a while with the Flying Tigers. He uh, went back to the Marine Corps. He was the commander of the, of the Black Sheep Squadron. And uh, he won the um, Congressional Medal of Honor. We ended up uh, one of the highest scoring aces uh, on the American side against the Japanese. And was, and was shot down finally and served several years in, the, uh, in a Japanese prisoner of war camp. Very famous guy. Mm -hmm. Next. Uh, th th these are the two, the, the bloodshed on the bottom is Pappy Boynton, and the next one up is Tex Hill. He wrote a, a, a good a book called God is My Co-Pilot about his experience as a pilot flying supplies over the Himalaya mountains and then fl also flying with the Flying Tigers. And these are on display at the museum there. Mm -hmm. Next. Uh, these are the patches of the U.S. forces that succeeded the, um, the um, Flying Tigers. And um, these are just the patches, and they're displayed on the wall uh, as a part of the museum, which I thought was nice that, that uh, they recognize those organizations. Next. Uh, now, after, after the, um, the Flying Tigers had uh, uh, served with the Chinese Air Force and had been absorbed by the, uh, by the American forces, uh, President Roosevelt decided he wanted to help do something to help the Chinese keep, to keep them in the war against the Japanese. And so he authorized the use of the B-29 Superfortress, which were, are these airplanes here. They're, they're, here they're flying now <coughs> over Japan. That's Mount Fuji in the background. Mm -hmm. And they decided to, to um, because except for the Doolittle Raid, which actually didn't do much damage, but w was a great... Uh, morale, morale, morale builder. Yeah. Um, we hadn't really attacked mainland Japan, and uh, Roosevelt wanted to do that uh, as soon as possible. So he he um, ordered that there there be uh, B-29 bombers stationed in India and in China, not too far from Kunming, near a place called Chengdu is is one place they flew from. So, but but they had to in order to get there, they had to fly over the Himalaya mountains. It was called flying the hump. And they had to fly all the bombs, all the airplanes, all the supplies. It was an enormous uh, undertaking. And there, those are, were the days when uh, you, you did star shoots to, to decide where you were. There was no GPS or any of that stuff. So you're a 21-year-old guy flying over Mount Everest you know, on a DC-3 <coughs> or a B-29. And uh, they, the, 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 these things had very long range. And they flew them for... Uh, I forget it was, it was um, from uh, June uh, 1944 until January 1945. Uh, and by that time, we had captured the Mariana Islands in the Pacific. And it was decided that the bombers should be stationed there because they'd be closer to hit Japan because the, the planes in China could only reach Kyushu, which is the southern island of Japan. Mm, interesting. And I think I have a map of, of that next. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, this shows you uh, the bombing of Kyushu from uh, the bases in China. It's this a this is a map from the, from the museum, actually. They, they covered this part of, the, of mm -hmm. our war effort as well. Mm -hmm. So, the, you know, the, the thing that really, the point I'd like to make and that I was really impressed with is that even though there may be political differences between the leaders of our country and China today, there's a lot of appreciation for what Americans did during World War II to help the Chinese people. And that, that, I thought, was pretty cool. Yeah, and inherent in what you say is it's, it's well worthwhile to go to China today, mm -hmm. to enjoy that relationship, to build that relationship, to be a citizen diplomat, mm -hmm. uh, to enhance that relationship. And that's what you do. 
But it's more than you. I think people in general should do that. This yes. is not a bad time to go to China. In fact, it's an important time to go to China, don't I, you think? I agree. I agree. Have we got some more pictures? I think that's the last one. No, this, okay. <laughs> I, 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 cl I climbed this mountain. Uh, it's called West Mountain there with a friend. And this guy, a uh, uh, gentleman, came up and wanted to have his picture taken with me. He was a really cool guy. He's, he's 80 years old. And I'm 76, so I thought we were the two oldest guys on the mountain that day. <laughs> Very nice man. Next. And this is, uh, this, uh, the, the interesting thing about Yunnan province is they say that there are 50 different minority groups that live in Yunnan province. And they have this huge uh, park is what it is, essentially. And uh, most of these groups are represented. And, um, and you can go on see displays of their crafts and uh, food and dance and other uh, cultural activities. And this was just the entrance of the place, and I, I think that's the last slide. So I was able to do quite a bit, <coughs> and that was thanks to my friend who, um, who drove me around the last day. Well, it made a long great. day, but that's it was great. worth it. And so this, you have a book on the table. What is that? This is a book about the Flying Tigers. Uh, I knew I was going there, so I read the book and um, got oriented a little bit, so I was uh, trying to be prepared. It's, um, let me just say it's Sam K-L-E-I-N-E-R, Kleiner, uh, and it's called The Flying Tigers, The Untold Story of the American Pilots Who Waged a Secret War Against Japan. Highly recommended. It's a good book. Yeah. It was secret at the time, wasn't it? Yeah, it yeah. was. Yeah. And, and apparently it was never really documented. Roosevelt kind of did it with a wink. Yeah. So uh, when are you going back? When are you going back for Jessup? When are you going to go back to China? Um, I'm not sure. I uh, probably go to Mongolia in May, and then uh, I'm trying to apply to do some teaching, maybe mm. in a summer mm. session in China. We'll see. Wherever you go, um, whatever you do, teaching, a moot court, or a combination, you should come back and talk to us about it, Shackley. Okay, and I'll bring some <laughs> more pictures. Please. Shackley Ruffello. <laughs> Thank uh, you, Jay. Chief Judge, retired of the Second Circuit Court, who is an inveterate uh, traveler and a most interesting guest here on ThinkTech. Thank you. Aloha. <laughs>